Meanwhile, we want to get you more analysis on what this market means, what we anticipate. David Bunsen is with us, CIO of the Bunsen Group. He has $3.7 billion in assets under management. It's always great to have you on the show, David. Just talk to us about where you are putting most of your focus. Is it on the micro, the earnings, or is it the macro, what the Fed says? Well, it's much more about bottom-up micro activities than the macro. I think that most of the macro news is known and there's uncertainty that persists, but we know where the uncertainties lie. We don't know exactly how they're going to play out, but it really comes down to this underlying tension of inflation versus recession. And our view is very much that inflation has peaked and will begin to come down. And we've believed for some time that the bulk of the inflation has been supply-side oriented. The Fed's uh, ability on the lever here is very limited. And so ultimately, we think that as recessionary conditions start surfacing, the Fed ends up having to adjust, to pivot. But along the way, we think there's great bottom-up stories taking place. We continue to do very well with consumer staples, energy, and other dividend growth-type names that don't rely on multiple expansion. David, where do you see us in the earnings cycle? I totally agree with you. It's really about the micro and it's about the earnings trends. Stock prices will always move in advance of the macro. But when you look at the earnings cycle, I think it's really interesting that analysts are anticipating this is the trough. This is the low in terms of growth. And it's mostly because comps are so, you start to get a little bit easier going forward. How do you see the earnings cycle playing out over the next couple of quarters? And what will that mean for the direction of stock prices? Now, I think for full year 2023, analysts are way behind at uh, where earnings will actually come in. I think the estimate around $250 of earnings to the S&P is ridiculously high. Mm-hmm. So I think you are going to start seeing more revisions. And the fact of the matter is that right now, some companies are getting in front of it, seeing their uh, stock price kind of suffer a bit after they announce otherwise good news, but the forward guidance is holding them back. And I think it sets them up for outperformance later. Later. And so we've seen that with a few companies that we think are being more aggressive than they need to be at talking down what they expect in the future. But sometimes that can really lead to upside surprises later. David, I'd love to get specific there. I mean, what companies have you noticed that trend with or what sectors? No, I'll tell specific companies. I am very confident that Blackstone did this last week, and I believe IBM as well. There was otherwise fantastic quarters from both of those companies, but what kind of held the stock back was them guiding a bit lower in terms of setting the table for underwhelming expectations into Q3 and Q4. And yet, I don't, I'm not convinced at all that the macro environment is going to hit those particular companies the way that they're setting it up for. Now, it in which case perhaps some of the bad news happens and is already priced in. But I also think it's created some upside surprises. The opposite of that dynamic is what has killed some of the big tech companies. The market is constantly expecting perfection from FANG, and perfection was unsustainable. And so not only did you end up getting less than perfect results, in some cases you got out-and-out bad results, and that has really affected those Netflixes and Facebooks this year. Are you anticipating more talk, therefore, of shoring up margins by maybe letting people go, slowing hiring at least, David? Yeah, definitely in the technology sector. I think that's where the bulk of the layoffs are going to be. A lot of it is because they kind of overhired through a lot of the expansion of 2019 through 21. And I think that tech faces compressed earnings and that you will see more layoffs and you will see reduced marketing spend, which has a trickle down effect. Give us a little sense of beyond tech, some of the tech-like names, because my my sense is there's more danger even in some of the tech-like names that are in the discretionary sector, like Amazon and Tesla, or the communication space, like Meta and Alphabet, than there is in traditional tech. But we've also seen tremendous price pressures emerge in those groups. What are you doing with tech-like stocks that are maybe not the traditional tech stocks? Yeah, so we are extremely boring in the way we get exposure to technology because we have this obsession with free cash flow and with strong balance sheets and with low P.E. multiples. And those P.E. ratios have been high forever with the types of names you're describing. So our exposure is in names like IBM and Cisco, where multiples are extremely low and there's great dividend and great dividend growth. People can say, well, you're not getting great growth out of the business. But look at IBM's cloud business, the revenue growth since the 
the Red Hat acquisition, we think they've set the table for great growth that now needs to convert. The free cash flow needs to convert into uh, profits, and I believe that that's going to happen with old tech. Our problem with new tech is mostly valuation-driven. Some of those companies are going to perform just fine. The problem is that you started off at obnoxiously high multiples, so there was no margin for error, and you have to have margin for error in this market environment. Obnoxiously high multiples. I love that description. Mm -hmm. How much further do you think it would take to fall where those uh, multiples would become less offensive? Yeah, obnoxiously high multiples is me being nice about it. Um, I think that when a company goes down 50% and it's still trading at 40 times earnings, there was probably a pretty big valuation problem to begin with. I've said this to clients for years. I admit that I'm a victim of the way I grew up in the 90s investing and seeing companies like Cisco, like Intel, that actually performed very well after the year 2000, but their stocks stayed in purgatory forever. Ever, simply because the valuation had gotten so high that even with great operating performance, you still can't really get a good bid in the stock. I think that's what has happened with Amazon, with Netflix, and, and frankly with Google as well, that they're going to suffer from just being a victim of their own success that bid up those multiples so high. And um, I can't tell you exactly what the P.E. ratio needs to go to because each of these companies now is really kind of uh, diverse from one another. They all have a high dispersion of results in the factors that are driving their stock prices. And so it's going to be a wild ride for Fang for the next several years. Mm -hmm. David, you're always so straight talking and we love it. David Bunsen, CIO of the Bunsen Group, we thank you. Stay well. Meanwhile, coming up, we are going